welcome to our ninth webinar. We're very excited to uh, have two very special invited guest speakers today to talk through some real world experience uh, in the use of UDIs, um, where it's being used in, in particularly in the clinical and hospital settings. Um, before we begin, I need to acknowledge that the Australian government is in caretaker mode. So we are about to have a federal election here next weekend. Um, and in accordance with caretaker conventions, I'll be limiting my statements today to factual issues and matters of administration. This presentation is for information only and does not constitute, constitute legal or formal advice and should not be relied on, upon for any purpose other than learning. I'd like to also begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on, and in my case here in Canberra, that's the Ngunnawal people. I wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and the region. I'd also like to acknowledge and welcome any other Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who might be attending today's event. For today, we have, as I mentioned, two very special invited guest speakers. We have Mr. Mark Songhurst from the Leeds Teaching Hospital Trust and Kirk Kikerokov, hopefully I got that close to right, from Prospitalia H-Track. Uh, if we have time, we'll have question and answers at the end but we can take those on notice if we don't quite get to them uh, because we have those two very special presentations today. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Mark Songhurst. So Mark's been working in the national hospital system for 23 years, for the last five years on the Scan for Safety team at Leeds Teaching Hospital NHS Trust. He's now the program lead, driving further implementation and integration of GS1 standards into the organisation. Having worked for 13 years in internal audit, he has an in-depth understanding of the processes from across the hospital that go into delivering good patient care. Mark is also a future-focused finance value maker and a School of Health and Care Radicals Change agent. He has a real passion for working with people and understanding how people collaborate across the NHS to make changes that will have a lasting impact on the service we provide to our patients. Mark was awarded the Future Focused Finance Award, they're all tongue twisters today, by the HFMA in 2018 in recognition of his work locally, regionally and nationally to improve NHS finance. His infectious willingness to accept change, to walk alongside NHS staff of all levels, enabling them to engage with change and try something new is helping drive the Scan for Safety project forward at Leeds. If the last two years in the healthcare industry have taught us anything, it is that we can no longer work alone. Therefore, Mark has been sharing his experience nationally and globally to ensure that the benefits the GS1 standards and Scan for Safety bring can be shared. So I'd like to hand over to Mark with also uh, a special note that he has had to uh, attend this at a very difficult hour for him in the UK. So we really appreciate his commitment to sharing his knowledge and experience with us today. So over to you, Mark. Michelle, so good morning, good afternoon and good evening from Leeds in the UK. Um, hopefully today I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey of part of what the work we are doing here at Leeds Teaching Hospitals and how we are using unique device identification throughout our hospitals to improve patient care. So as Michelle said, I am the programme lead for Scan for Safety at Leeds Teaching Hospitals and our program has been now in the organization for six years we're coming up to the sixth anniversary uh later this month um just so that i can set a bit of a picture for you this is a slide used by uh my boss and shows the complexity of the healthcare system in the uk alone and what we were actually looking at for the small part that is the hospital, we are one of the purple boxes in the bottom right hand corner. There is a whole range of the healthcare sector that goes on behind the scenes. Uh, but this is one tiny portion of it that is seen by uh, the, our patients. So what were the national drivers for Scan for Safety? Um, we started off in Europe in 
2013 with uh, a recall on breast implants after a company was using substandard products in um, manufacture. Um, that at Leeds took us eight months of searching through paper records to be able to trace back to patients. Um, that was seen as a shame. Luckily for the healthcare sector, of the 30,000 patients affected by this, in the he National Health Service, we only had 465 cases uh, reported where we'd used those products. But still, we couldn't accurately and easily trace where those products had been. At a similar time, uh, the food industry in the UK um, discovered that horse meat had been applied into uh, various processed meat products, uh, not labelled on the products, so people didn't know what they were eating. There was a very big recall done and supermarkets removed those products from the shelves within half an hour. Um, this was seen by the Department of Health, now the Department of Health and Social Care, as um, a real eye-opener that what we'd just been through on breast implants, we couldn't replicate in a hospital. And so that was brought into the National Health Service e-procurement strategy as to how we can use unique device identification and other standards to be able to recall products. And there were some example sites picked. So we had examples of um, big hospital trusts like ourselves, and I'll come on to um, our organisation very shortly, um, all the way down to very small cottage hospitals to see what whether you could implement this at scale. Uh, so what we were trying to uh, introduce was GS1 standards and the public uh, pan-European public procurement online standards. Um, this became known as scan for safety just to make it a lot easier for people to say than the global standards one and the pan-european uh, pan public procurement online standards so if i give you a welcome to leeds leeds is in the north of england and our trust looks after seven hospitals they range from very small ambulatory hospitals at seacroft through to small cottage hospitals at wharfdale and then all the way up to our two main sites of st james's and leeds general infirmary each of which have about a thousand beds on them we are the largest provider of specialist adult and paediatric services in the UK and we provide about 150 different specialist services in the organisation. We have a regional responsibility for 5.2 million people and we do everything from heart valve replacement surgery, robotic surgery, uh, we are a major trauma centre for the north of England so we frequently end up with our patients being flown in by helicopter um, we are a leading cancer centre and we are the only UK hand transplant surgery setting. So the goals of our organisation are to be the best for patient safety, quality and experience, uh, to be the best place to work, to offer a seamless and integrated care. And that's not just within our hospital, that's starting to look wider afield. So we're not talking just one sector of our hospital to the next. We're talking with our community colleagues, with our colleagues that are um, based in other hospitals across the region and with social care settings so that a patient sees care as one continuum, not as individual organisations all impacting. Uh, we want to be the centre for research, innovation and education, as well as for those specialist services. And obviously, as with any organisation, we want to be financially sustainable. And we were one of the few trusts in the UK to be actually rated by the Care Quality Commission as outstanding for our use of resources. What drives the work here at Leeds are the values that we have and these were defined by the organisation and these have a real impact on what we can do and how we can work with people. So as a member of staff I'm accountable to not only my managers but to the patients whom we serve and to other colleagues. We work in a very collaborative manner so 
just because I'm doing scan for safety and I sit within procurement doesn't mean to say that I don't work alongside my clinical colleagues to deliver the best care possible uh, and spend time with them in the healthcare settings, understanding how they work. We're empowered to make our own decisions and with 18,000 members of staff here at Leeds, that's really important. I don't need permission all the time to do things. Actually, if it's in my role and my remit, then that's how we make the changes happen. We are fair in the way we work and honest and transparent. And most importantly, we are patient centered. So we are always looking for where does the patient fit? And as we talk through uh, unique device identification, then that is where actually keeping a focus on the patient is really important. Um, when we undertook Scan for Safety and started in our journey, one of the things that we did was we looked at a hospital that had already been doing this. Uh, and to Kirk's delight, it will be that we actually followed Derby who had already started well down the route of this using HTRAC. So HTRAC has been a part of the National Health Service uh, and the journey of Scan for Safety. So let's pick a product. We're going to pick this. It is a TAVI, a transaortic valve implantation. It could be known by its brand name. So we could pick that it's a Medtronic, we, you know, just picking a brand name in general. Um, it could be known as the manufacturer's part code. Um, and that's quite often what um, our inventory teams talk about. Uh, our data teams talk about it as an inventory management customer item number. All of these cause confusion because when you look at an electronic system, a manufacturer's part code, product code could be the same for a variety of products. Uh, we did have at one point one manufacturer's product code in our organisation that covered either a syringe, a blunt fill, a filter needle or a porcine heart valve. So if we'd have got the wrong company with the same manufacturer's product code, we could have well and truly ended up with a shock if we'd have ordered a mass box of syringes but sent it to the heart valve company. Um, so what is needed is a unique way of identifying products and in the UK we've mandated the use of GS1 standards within healthcare and that allows us to use the GTIN as the mandated globally unique item so that's the global trade item number and that allows us to follow a product through at points. So when I'm talking about where does this fit in? So how this works at Leeds at the moment is our clinical colleagues will identify that we need to use a specific product. Um, that could be because of the nature of the patient. So being the regional center, we could be the last option for surgery for a patient. So we may need a specific device for them. Um, once we've decided which product we need clinically, then there is an approval from management and there is a procurement process as to how we will get that item into the hospital. At that point, once we've done all the procurement, we get the catalogue from the manufacturer, which contains the unique device identification um, details. So it starts to build that GTIN. Uh, so we know it is exactly the right products that goes through and that assigns to our price list. We then enter that into the trust catalogue and you can see um, the, the one that we use at Leeds. There are alternatives out there, but our trust catalogue um, holds all the data about that specific product. We will then be able to use our inventory system to set the levels of that stock that we need. Is it a one off item that will come in be implanted and possibly not used again? Is it an item that we need on the shelf continually? So our favoured items are all uh, available there. And as we bring that order in, we then get the next level of data about that product. So knowing exactly what it is in the unique device identification is really good. But at this point, when it hits the inventory system, we are starting to bring in the serial number, the batch number, the lot number and the sterilization expiry date to be able to 
manage that product within the hospital and we'll come on to how that fits later. That same identification fits through the Trust Financial Enterprise Resourcing Pack platform. Um, so it fits through all our orders and where an item is on inventory, on inventory, we've agreed that stock level financially. So actually it's a smooth process in ordering. Our clinicians are not having to go out and order everything uh, and say, is this one we want? If they've used it, the system tells us it's been used and will auto replenish if we've set it to auto replenish. Um, so that we can actually automatically order things so that our clinicians just know that they need to go to the shelf and pick the next one up. There is never a worry that we will run out. Um, that data is then fed through the PEPOL interchange. So we send an order out, it goes out as clean data into the internet through the PEPOL interchange and out to our distributor. Um, that manufacturer and distributor can then pick up their order knowing exactly what we want they can deliver the goods to the hospital um, we are starting to actually work on getting advanced shipping notices so actually knowing exactly what is coming in to the hospital and then we will be able to receive the invoice from the supplier and actually pay that invoice within 30 days and that's because with all of the data that flows through we can do a match on the product, on the quantity and on the company very quickly and that invoice can be paid through the system. So unique device identification filtering in at all those levels in multiple forms is really important to the way in which we do business um, but also let's look at how this affects our patients. So if we look at a patient journey within the UK, our patients will quite often start their journey at their local doctor's surgery, um, especially for things that are going to be implanted. The other option, of course, is that they come in as a trauma patient uh, through one of our ED, but we're just going to look at somebody that's needing surgery. And we use the term elective in the UK, um, which means non-essential surgery. Um, or surgery that can be planned um, as opposed to urgent care uh, in the event of an accident. Once you've seen your local doctor, you will be referred to an outpatients department where we will undertake some diagnostics. At this point, you will meet with uh, some of our clinical teams and our clinical teams will decide the best course of treatment with the patient. And at that point, we can quite often say this is the product we are going to use. And what we're working on is actually taking that product at that point and starting to assign it to a patient. A patient joins the waiting list, we schedule them for surgery, they will come in on the day of surgery and that product then is available for them. We take it off the shelf, we implant it into the patient in theatres and record its usage. And as part of that, we're taking that into the medical record so that we can um, recall at any point in a system that is appropriate for clinicians to understand. Um, the patient will recover in hospital, they will discharge and they will go back to their general practitioner, their local doctor. So how does that work in terms of that theatre pay piece? We have products on the shelf in two ways. Uh, we have our general stock and our consumables. These are items that are grabbed off the shelf. They are commonly known within the hospital as the plastic tat um, within procurement. So they are the small items, they are cannulas, they are syringes. Uh, these are not trapped by batch to a patient because we will use them very quickly, very frequently, and we don't use UDI for those products other than in the ordering process. The other form is full inventory and that's the photograph on the bottom left hand side that's our interventional radiography labs at uh, St James's Hospital. That storeroom um, will feed all of the products that we inventory manage so those that we need UDI for 
and the left hand side of that storeroom and part of the right hand side, we know exactly which products are on the shelf using UDI. When we take that product, we record it in the operating theatre against a certain number of other uh, factors. We record it against the clinician who uses it. We record it against the place that that product has been used. And most importantly, we record it against the patient. We're also able to do the same for any blood that we use in that operation. So it's not just our products, it is also the blood as well that is used within the procedure. And at that point, we have a complete record of what happened in our operating theatre that we can access electronically. If you wanted to see it as a data systems flow, this is where um, that patient journey that I just described is seen in the blue boxes and we pick up various items. So we pick up on here the um, patient demographics from our patient administration system. So we're able to get an accurate record of which patients we've got. Uh, we're currently working on integrating with our theatre management system so that we will be able to bring through what we know as the OPCS code, the Operating um, Procedure Clinical Standard Code, and we're able to then bring that through into a record, and that all feeds into Omnicell. So we have our correct patient with the correct procedure, and we're able to pull a kitting list, and we're hoping in the next year to roll that kitting list out um, fully into our organisation. In the background, we're pulling all the product data and location data from um, from the GS1 location management tool, from the product data we're pulling from the manufacturer through our systems, and that all links in together. Once we've got all that record in an, one place, we're feeding um, different systems out of it. So we're feeding our costing and inf and patient level um costing teams data that's the blue box we're feeding ppm plus which is our in-house electronic health record and we're starting that um, integration as we speak um, we know exactly where it's going to go it's going to go automatically into the op note so when a surgeon opens up their op note after a procedure they will know exactly which products we've used and then we have further reporting that we need to do into the National Health Service digital team um, for registers on a national basis as to products that we've used, especially around implants. And we're working on automating that link as well. This is a quote from a friend of mine who is a healthcare um, commentator in the UK, a former patients advocate and uh, former chief executive of Hospital Trusts, uh, which says data is useless unless it's turned informa into information and information is useless unless it's properly targeted. And that's really important. The data is really good, but we have to target it. So we have to be able to assign meaning to it, whether that's the product and the patient assigned, the product and the location for recall, if we don't target that data properly, then actually nobody uses it. So it's always worth bearing that in mind. So what are the benefits of the work we've done? We're able to control our stock far better. And part of our success in this is we've introduced inventory managers into our organisation who manage stock on behalf of clinicians. So on the left hand side, you'll see a picture of lots of items stacked up on uh, a desk. This was £126,000 worth of stock. It went out of date in an RFID control cabinet because nobody was looking at the data. Nobody was looking at what was going to go out. We knew all about the product, but nobody was looking at it. So as you start to implement this work on UDI, make sure you've got people looking at the data. Does this work for recall? So if you remember at the start of my presentation, I talked about it taking us eight months to sift through um, patient records on paper. With the product recall, this work 
uh, had to be repeated in 2019. And these are the timings from that recall. So at 10.15, we received formal notification from our regulatory authority that a product no longer had a CE mark, so could not be used within the hospital. Within 13 minutes, we had confirmed that we did have some of those products in the organization. And we'd also checked with the clinical areas that were using them that um, they weren't going to be used that day. By 11.42 on the same day, we had removed those products from the shelves. They were in quarantine with our inventory managers and would not be used within surgery. Luckily, we didn't need to do a recall of patients for this um, piece of work. So we were able to leave it at that. If we'd have needed to recall patients, had they been using the scan for safety system, um, so, so time-wise, you know, if it was whilst we'd been using scan for safety in that area, we would have been able to recall those patients in that same time and have a list given to a surgeon to revise the surgery and actually meet with the patients. But there are financial benefits to being able to do this work. So we've been able to re reduce the amount of time that theatre staff are doing those product recalls because we know where to look for our products, exactly which shelf they should be on and pull them back quickly. We're able to reduce our inventory because we've got clean data going through. We know exactly how much of a product we are using and we are certain of that. So we're not placing a clinical member of staff under pressure of thinking, I've only got one of these on the shelf. If I drop it, that's it. I've got to completely come out of the operation and start again. We're able to have the right amount on the shelves, but that is not to have excess stock. So we started off looking at the TAVIs, the trans aortic valve implantations. Um, those in our trust, we were the largest centre in the UK for implanting those, but we had 16 weeks worth of stock on the shelf. When we start looking at the data, we know we are not going to use 16 weeks worth of stock before we can replenish it. We can replenish it within a week. So we're able to drop that down and we now have 21 days worth of stock available. We're able to return stock into the healthcare system and make sure that the stock is used where it's needed. And if we've got a product that's going out of date, we're able to work with a manufacturer because we know which product, we can take it off the shelf and send it to a hospital that can use it. Um, using this, it's also quicker and easier to recall those products or to manage them and get the information to the right place. So we're building this into our new hospitals. Um, the hospital that you see behind me will come online in 2026. Um, it is a brand new hospital in the city centre. Storage for product is at a premium and there is a bonus for cutting down on the amount of storage space. So using systems like Omnicell, like HTRAC, really do help in your inventory management. They decrease the amount of products you need on the shelf because you're able to manage your products in the correct way. So allowing our staff to live up to those Leedsway values and to remain patient centered in everything that we do with that product. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark. Really appreciate uh, your presentation. We will move forward now. Uh, just a reminder, please, um, that the questions are now open for Slido. So if you have any questions uh, for Mark or for Kirk, please uh, send them through Slido. Um, without further ado, I'd like to uh, reintroduce Kirk Kikirikov, who will be presenting on Prospitali from Prospitalo H-Track. And as you heard Mark uh, talk through, it was also involved in, in some of the UK hospitals and some of that work. So Kirk's committed to achieving sustainable healthcare through digital technologies and has been dedicated to this cause for two decades. As the Managing Director of Prospitalia H-Track, he specialises in innovative software solutions for the complex supply chains that exist 
for medical devices. This includes life-saving and life-enhancing technologies such as implantable prostheses and other medical devices. His work has contributed to delivering innovative software for patient safety while also delivering cost savings and efficiency in the supply chain. He joined the HTRAC business soon after the company's establishment in 2002 and has developed the capability of the business to where it is today, with 25% of the Australian acute hospitals using the HTRAC software and its interna internationalisation with growth in New Zealand, Germany and the UK. I will hand over to you now, Kurt. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you to uh, all of your delegates online uh, for joining uh, this presentation. I'll talk a little bit first about uh, our company, Prospitalia Haystrack, um, where we've come from, the journey that we've been on uh, to bring us to where we are today. Um, and then I'll, my following slides will be more about um, UDI, uh, its role uh, in all of this, uh, and uh, certainly Mark spoke uh, uh, very eloquently about the sorts of things that Leeds Hospital is doing uh, with UDI technologies, um, but also some case studies or, or use cases um, for UDI uh, in healthcare. Um, it's more than just procurement, and Mark obviously alluded to that uh, in terms of patient safety, but there are other use cases as well uh, that need to be uh, considered uh, when creating or designing or implementing systems uh, around the UDI. So a little bit about our company. Uh, this year marks actually 20 years since we established uh, in Melbourne in 2002 in Australia. Um, we, are a we were a startup company back then. Uh, the vision of our company was always to develop uh, software as a service that would be cloud-based and that would, be, uh, that would have a component of that software on mobile technology so that you can capture data at the patient bedside. That was the vision for the development of this company or for the creation establishment of the uh, of the haystrack business back in 2002 and to this day we have lived up to that vision the software has evolved uh, it's become more complicated and complex in the in the functionality that it delivers to the market um, through integrations with other ecosystem uh, other systems within the ecosystem of hospitals um, but um, that core principle uh, of, um, of our company remains to this day. So by, by living up to that vision, we're able to create a patient-centric system designed for the unique challenges that exist in healthcare around medical devices. So there's obviously the benefit of supply chain and product replenishment making sure that clinicians don't run, a pro run out of products when they use, when they need them, uh, that, um, that they are uh, more efficient in the use of those products in terms of the inventory and how much inventory is held and all of those sorts of supply chain inventory type benefits. Uh, in Australia, we have this unique um, um, uh, we, we have this unique uh, consideration around prosthesis billing or, or billing for implantable devices. In most countries around the world, uh, the implantable devices are paid for uh, by the DRG uh, for the entire episode of care. Uh, in Australia, the prosthesis for private patients, at least not for public, are paid for uh, by health insurance. So we have this unique consideration in Australia where we must um, capture uh, all of the details that are required around the product, uh, an implantable product uh, for private patients um, that allow the billing process to occur seamlessly. And without a system like the Haystrack system, what we have out there is a lot of gaps in billing. Um, it's as small as 20%, but up to 300% gap uh, in, in 
billing. So in other words, savings that can be made by having a HREC system are quite substantial in this area alone. Uh, the third point there, product traceability um, to patient and documentation in the electronic medical record. Without a system like Haystrack, uh, where you are capturing data at the point of care from information that's on the, on the uh, packaging of the product, usually barcode scanning, um, preferably barcode scanning, um, uh, the documentation in the EMR usually occurs by somebody typing that information into the EMR. And the inherent problems with that of errors um, or information not being clear, um, whereas when you're scanning a barcode, you're getting the correct information all the time, and that information is being transferred to the electronic medical record. And of course, patient safety, and, uh, and I, I'll elaborate just a little bit on what Mark said, but um, the product recall is is fairly significant, as is um, expired stock. So uh, when you scan a product for uh, the barcode, um, has the has the expiry date on it. So uh, particularly for those critical products like implants, um, uh, the system is able to warn the user that there is an expired product there as well as, of course, inventory, uh, what expired product is in inventory. <laughs> so I mentioned the data captured the bedside using mobile technology. Um, in the early days, it was uh, PDA, it was uh, um, some, some uh, technology that's pr pretty much obsolete now. Um, but these days we use um, Android-based uh, essentially like mobile phone uh, technology uh, scanners um, uh, within within uh, these hospitals. Uh, the other thing that we did from the outset was uh, to develop a central product master database that will serve all of our customers. So we have an item master, if you like, a product master database of all of the products that are consumed, purchased, used, um, within these hospital settings so that when you scan that barcode, it's recognised, the product is recognised um, from that uh, core database. And it contains core information in its uh, product descriptions, units of measure, um, rebate codes uh, in the Australian example, uh, and so forth. So all the core information that's required uh, for these certain transactions to occur. And last point I'd like to make is that the UDI was a core design feature for our software from the outset. That is 20 years ago, we recognised that we had to have a UDI. It wasn't called UDI, of course, back then. Um, it was referred to, in fact, as the universal product number from, from America. And it was the recognition of um, two standards in, ess in essence at that time, the HIBC and the GS1 standards. And the FDA, of course, um, has issuing agencies, uh, which I understand is the model that will be used uh, in Australia. And uh, the U European Commission, of course, um, has issuing agencies, uh, which will be HIBC and GS1. And so that core principle um, has existed in our software from day one, and it's worked. And that's the main thing to uh, recognise about that. Um, the other thing that our software does is we have a very detailed, because we were able to capture information at the bedside, we have very granular spend analytics uh, at a procedure level, basically. And, and this enables our hospitals to uh, be more efficient and design programs to make savings, uh, just to make improvements generally uh, to, to the way they operate. Uh, we integrate with all the core systems, the ECHO system as it's called within the hospital, so patient administration systems, electronic medical record, billing systems, ERP or enterprise resource planning, uh, and clinical costing systems. Our system in, in Australia is used 
by around 20% of the Australian uh, acute hospitals. And that's growing at a rate of 30% per annum year on year. And of the principal referring, referral hospitals, so these are the big or ternary facilities that exist in Australia, uh, around 50% of those principal referral hospitals in Australia are using the HRAC system. We've expanded into New Zealand and we have some good um, solid customers there with Wellington and, uh, and uh, a few others that are coming on board soon. Uh, in the UK um, and in Germany. Germany's uh, growing at a rate of about 50 or 60 percent per annum right now. Uh, so there's big expansion of the HVAC system happening within that country. And lastly, Mark did mention this, um, but the HVAC system is used at Derby and Burton University Hospitals Foundation Trust. And it was the first uh, trust to be accredited under the Scan for Safety program. I believe the accreditation happened uh, in late 2017. Um, but yeah, it was the first to be accredited under that Scan for Safety program. It was one of the six demonstrator sites, uh, Leeds and a number of others being the other. Um, moving to my next slide. Um, okay, apologies for that. I, okay, next slide. Look, I've mentioned all of this. Um, uh, I'll just be very quick about it. But yes, uh, the system is patient centric model, data capture at the point of care. And if you can do that, then you can have business processes that manage inventory well. Uh, you have a reporting functionality uh, at a very granular level. It facilitates e-electronic transactions, e-purchasing, etc. It facilitates electronic billing and of course, but not least, uh, is patient safety because you are tracing products uh, down to the lot serial number expiry date uh, to the patient. So why is the UDI important? Um, a few points here. It provides certainty in the market. So for both suppliers and providers, it provides a certainty about what, what investments to make for your systems, um, for, your, for the work that you do on cataloging and all of those sorts of things. So that is really important to make sure you have um, take up um, within, with suppliers and with providers. So I think the UDI is a very, very positive thing. It's certainly been very positive um, uh, uh, with the FDA uh, regulation around UDI. There's been a very positive take up uh, of, um, of UDI technology. It guarantees penetration, it, uh, in other words, um, more providers, suppliers will take up that technology, which means that you get ubiquity across the market of, um, of these technologies. And, and I say technologies, uh, UDI is one component of that. It's a facilitator um, that enables these systems to be built, basically. It removes inconsistency. It reduces cost in duplication of effort and costly workarounds. Um, it, relies, uh, it, it provides a consistent and reliable framework for software and systems developers. So for people like us who develop software, uh, we need these sorts of things so that, uh, so that the uh, software that you build doesn't have to have a whole bunch of workarounds and customizations, etc. So you're building, you're building it on a, a solid um, standards uh, basis. Um, uh, for, for, for Australia, by following the regulations that are already in place in the US um, through the FDR, FDA and the European Commission, um, we're a global player. My, one of my next slides will talk about uh, how much product is imported into Australia. So we have to recognise that we don't do a lot of manufacturing in Australia. So we have to follow um, uh, follow uh, what other um, jurisdictions uh, have done in that space as well. 
So the TGA adopting the UDI is a logical extension of what is already happening globally. And so I've got a couple of example labels uh, on the page here. You can see the first one is, um, is um, where the issuing agency is HIBCC, and they're using the HIBC barcodes uh, at the bottom there. Those barcodes contain uh, the product identifier component or data identifier, as it's called in the UDI language and uh, as well as um, lot number, serial number, expiry date type information in that second barcode. And the second one there, uh, the issuing agency is GS1, and it's a similar thing. There's a barcode uh, on uh, that package. There's actually three on there, but they're all, they're all the same thing, essentially the same thing. There's just stickers that are usually used uh, where they take these stickers off and put them on patient record. That's the old way. Um, and that still does happen a lot uh, out in the marketplace. <laughs> um, moving to my next slide. So what do we see in practice? So from all the implementations that we've done, there's around 70, 70 to 80 hospitals globally that use the HTRAC system now. Um, so what have we seen in practice? Uh, more than 90% of the product data usage captured through Haystrack is by scanning manufacturers' barcodes now. So that's actually quite a significant um, statistic. Uh, in the early days, it was a lot less than that. So the global trends and what the FDA has done, et cetera, has really contributed to a large extent uh, to uh, the automation, if you like, uh, because scanning a barcode is an automated way of capturing this sort of data. The other point is that um, more than 90% of medical devices by volume are imported into Australia. So there's not a lot of manufacturing uh, that happens in Australia. The top 20 companies globally uh, in Australia represent more than 70% uh, of all medical devices sold into the Australian market. That This is what we see consistently across all of our customers. And it's fair to say that that's also true in the other markets that we operate. So in the UK and Germany and New Zealand, that is also the case. So there's, so, that, so while there are a lot of companies, hundreds of medical devices companies in the world, it's the top 20 that do the most volume. In Australia, there are there, there are a few very large distributors or, or large East distributors um, or importers uh, uh, that represent many manufacturers from overseas. So one example uh, is Life Healthcare, who are an importer, distributor, importer of um, products from many places around the world, many manufacturers. These companies have very little control on what is included in the label. So they, so they rely on, um, uh, on standards being in place, um, the UDI standards. Um, there are equally in Australia, a lot of small and medium enterprises um, that are importers of some very niche and highly specialised products. And these companies have even less influence on the manufacturing operations. So therefore, again, I, I stress that last point, it's logical, logical for Australia to be in harmony with the FDA slash EC on, on UDI. Uh, some of the challenges that we have seen, um, doesn't happen very often, but when it does happen, it is quite problematic. And that is the incorrect application of standards. So while a company in good faith has tried to use um, one of the standards um, in UDI, um, they sometimes don't apply it correctly. And that does result in some problems um, because uh, you have to sort of disable then the barcode um, so that it can't be scanned uh, because it's incorrect. Um, so that's something that, um, that the issuing agencies need to work uh, with their supplier companies to make sure that they educate them properly on the application of the standards as well. 
The other challenge um, that still exists uh, is with fragment sets. And by that, we're talking about um, generally orthopedics, but it does occur in other areas as well. But things like screws, plates, rods, etc., that are used in trauma or orthopedics, um, these products are often, are often uh, supplied non-sterile. That means they arrive in the mm. hospital, they go into caddies and things like that. Um, and they have to go through a sterilization process first. So they get put into these sterile trays, um, goes through a sterilization process. And then when they reach the theater or the operating rooms or the place where they do the surgery, uh, there is no packaging. Um, so capturing the uh, lot number or serial number for those products becomes almost impossible without some sort of workaround. So, so there is um, these challenges that ex still exist there. The other one is uh, kits and bundled products. So from a traceability stand standpoint, every product that you use on a patient uh, needs to be captured for traceability. Um, so the UDI therefore needs to be applied at the smallest unit, and that usually means that each but that doesn't always happen because the supplier will consider the selling unit only. So the labeling, et cetera, happens on the selling unit that might have two, it might have five products in it, but that's not what gets implanted into the patient. So yeah, we have to be conscious of those sorts of uh, use cases as well. Um, the available real estate on product package um, is also sometimes limiting as to what you can put on there. So there needs to be a clear definition of the use cases and the design of the systems to deal with all those unique uh, use cases that exist in healthcare. And finally, stakeholder engagement. So this is really critical. Um, there needs to be a good education program around the UDI and the systems that are implemented and how they are going to facilitate better processes. Um, and that communication has to be at all level. And there needs to be a really good solid change management program. Uh, I'm conscious of time. I don't have a lot of time left. Um, so I'll just very briefly talk about this slide, but at, typically when we do rollouts, these are the sorts of systems that we find that we have to integrate into. So patient management, where we get demographic data, coming into the Haystrack system, uh, electronic medical record, where we write into the electronic medical record, the consumption, the usage of products, um, operating room management systems or theater management systems as they're commonly referred to, uh, getting information on planned procedures and, and, and the documentation actually of the case back into Haystrack so that you've got granular data from which to analyze and um, clinical costing, ERP, and, and billing systems. <clears throat> and just very briefly, implant registries, there are many implant registries, and these are mostly run by, uh, by colleges, the College of Surgeons, for example. For example, the Australian Orthopaedic Association runs the National Joint Registry. Um, these registries require not just the capture of products that are used, but there's certain clinical data as well, as well that needs to be included uh, on the record that uh, look at or over time can analyze product efficacy. So that's one of the core functions of some of these um, registries so they can do their longitudinal studies. So that's also quite important. Um, most of the time, the capture of this data is by manual means. In other words, these forms, that, there's an example form there that you see, it's a hip form from the Australian Orthopaedics Association, the Joint Registry. These are filled in manually, generally. Um, and, and so we want to make this electronic to make it more efficient and also to avoid duplication of effort. Um, okay, I'll move on. I'm just conscious of time. I don't have much left. Um, so example case studies, customer ABC, uh, customer A, some of the, uh, the prosthesis and patient billing because we were able to automate that process. 
uh, there was a reduction in processing time of eight hours per day, resulting in a saving of 1.2 million. So massive operating efficiencies. Uh, customer B, they went from 3.8 million billing um, to 5 million, a 30% improvement. Um, customer C, similar billing went from 3 million to 9 million, a 300% improvement. Um, and then they used the HVAC data to get um, savings from improved management uh, of consumables and prosthetics, and they got 7 million per annum. And just a few slides to show some business intelligence um, type dashboards. This is using our H control product, and you can see the sort of granular information you have on spend um, down to procedure levels uh, or specialty levels. And the next one along, we're looking at a total knee replacement, for example. Who are the surgeons? What did they spend? How long did they take? What was their average spend? And who do they prefer to use? Um, so this is the sort of information you can get to when you capture data at the bedside. So that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirk and Mark. And I can see we're right on time now. Um, we have a range of really, really good questions. So what we might do to make sure that we we cover them comprehensively is we'll take them offline and we'll, we've got a recording of them and we'll provide answers at the start of the next webinar. So we have probably about 10 questions, uh, which are really, really good questions for Mark and for Kirk. So we'll do those and uh, Mark and Kirk appreciate your input to those before our next webinar, if that's okay. Um, for anyone who can stay on, I'm just going to quickly go through uh, one more slide before we, we finish up. So. Um, we are going to talk in, the, in our June webinar on the 21st of June about the Australian UDI Sandpit. So that is the ability now that we're uh, planning to make available in July for users of the Australian UDI database to test and give us feedback on what we've built, to put data in, to take data out, to do searching. So all the functionality um, that's needed to make sure that we've built it in the right way. So we've, we've got some time uh, between now and next year to, to get feedback, to have it used uh, and to, to get those things right. So what we'll do in June is provide more information about the Sandpit, how you might use it, um, how to log on, what the processes are uh, specifically for the Sandpit. So again, uh, apologies we've run over, but I really want to thank uh, Mark and Kirk for their uh, sharing their experience today. That was very helpful and we have a really good range of questions uh, and we will take those and prepare those for the next webinar. So thank you so much, everybody. Have a lovely Tuesday and we'll see you back in June.